Good afternoon. I am going to call to order this regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole for Wednesday, February 26, 2020. My name is Andrea Jenkins, and I am the chair of this committee. And with me at the dais today are Council Members Palmasano, Johnson, Ellison, Schrader, Council President Bender, Council Member Gordon, Council Member Reich, Council Member Fletcher, and the Vice Chair of the Committee, Council Member Cunningham. Let the record reflect that we do have a quorum. And colleagues, today we have one item for discussion today, and that is the report of the Neighborhood Revitalization Program and the Community Participation Program Fund Balance. And I will invite up um, staff from our Neighborhood and Community Relations Department to give that presentation. Good afternoon, Mr. Rubidor. The Chair Jenkins and uh, committee members, good afternoon. I am David Rubidor, the Director of the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department. And as the Chair mentioned, I am here today to present a report on the current, what is often referred to as the NRP fund balance. And basically giving you some background and some understanding of um, what that term actually means and what is in there. And I'm kind of, there we go. My computer got stuck, my apologies. So on February 12th, the city council, uh, the cow, uh, um, uh, at the cow meeting, the city council directed the NCR department to work with development finance to come back and present a report to you today about the current um, uh, unspent and uncontracted and contracted money with the NRP fund balance. Today's report um, is really a receive and file uh, for your information. So starting out first, just kind of starting with a high level. Mr. Rubidor, just before you yep. uh, dive into your report, I just want to let my colleagues know that um, while speaker management is on, I cannot log into my computer for some reason. And so I'm going to ask if we just use the, um, the hand method um, with your little cues at the dais. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Uh, to continue on, um, first of all, really kind of starting from the high level, what's called the NRP fund balance actually includes all of the money that is currently unspent, both contracted and uncontracted, but it is currently unspent um, by our neighborhood organizations, uh, which includes NRP phase one, NRP phase two, and also the community participation program. The community participation program, when it was first um, put into place in 2010, was actually added to the NRP ordinance, and so therefore it technically is considered part of the NRP program. So the total balance currently in the NRP fund balance is $37,320,000. As you can see on the chart here, the vast majority of that, or actually the slight majority of that, sorry, is uh, money that's in a, currently in the NRP phase two program. Um, the next biggest chunk is the money that's left over, a little over $9 million that's um, in the NRP Phase 1 program. And then the green area that's on the chart is what's it currently in the Community Participation Program. Now, sometimes when you hear about the NRP fund balance, you hear different numbers. Um, this, this fund balance changes from time to time. And as I go through this today and explain this, hopefully that will become a little bit clearer as to what, um, why it changes. Well, first of all, looking, or secondly, I was going to say, looking at the um, allocation by neighborhood, the fund balance is actually allocated out to every neighborhood in the city, and the balance varies considerably across the city about who has what kind of balance left. Um, the map that you see here really kind of shows the distribution of where the money is currently allocated to and remaining unspent. That includes the, uh, um, the, the lighter areas, which are shaded in yellow, basically have a fund balance from zero up to about $100,000. The dark area, the darkest areas on the map, are neighborhood organizations that have more than a million dollars left in their NRP fund balance. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of factors that affect what's really in the fund balance and why it changes and stuff over time. And I wanted to, I think, really kind of spend a little bit on this because the, uh, there are some nuances as to why certain neighborhoods have certain different levels of funding. 
Um, first of all, in 2010, um, the city council took an action to reprogram $10 million out of the uh, NRP program into the CPP program and basically stop the capitalization of the community participation program for two years. And so that money was taken out. In essence, the total amount of money that was available and allocated to neighborhoods had dropped by $10 million. Um, that was done in an effort at, a, at that time, if I recall correctly, um, there were some significant tax increases, property tax increases across the city, and that was done as an attempt to mitigate that while still continuing to have money go out to neighborhoods. That money, um, uh, in 2017, the city council committed to repaying that money back into the program, and over the last um, three years, that $10 million has come back into the program, so a $10 million repayment, in essence. Also, neighborhoods started the NRP program at different times. Um, the first neighborhood, I believe, started in 1992, um, and the last NRP phase two plan was approved in 2017. So there's a significant span of time when people or in neighborhoods went into, neighborhood organizations went into the program. And so um, some of the neighborhoods that went in early had obviously more time to spend it down than others that came into it later. Also, in the $37 million balance, the uh, allocation for 2020 into the community participation program was just released or just allocated, and that's another $4.1 million that came in just a, um, a couple or a month ago. Uh, neighborhoods also re receive program income, which I'm going to talk about in a minute and go in a little bit more uh, greater detail. Um, and also, neighborhoods were given the possibility or the ability to spend the money um, at at their, at their pace. Um, and so, uh, depending on the priorities and the uh, decisions that they made about where the money was going, timing really did vary quite a bit and does continue to vary quite a bit about how fast money is going out. And just finally, another uh, point I wanted to mention is that. Um, a lot of times neighborhoods will invest into housing developments. Um, they, often are, they often are the first funder into some difficult or challenging housing developments across the city, and that money goes contracted and then will sit there um, for a period of time while developers actually go out and try to get the rest of the money into place. And that can tie up the money for um, an extended period of time, oftentimes years. So those are, those are just some of the factors that really affect um, the fund balance kind of on an ongoing basis. I want to dive into program income because I think this is very significant for this program as well. So program income is when a neighborhood organization has invested their money into some kind of repayment program, whether it is a housing uh, loan uh, for a housing development or business loan or something to that effect, where money actually gets paid back over time and then goes back into the program. And so by ordinance, the, uh, the city council years ago had determined that any money coming back into the program was belonged to the neighborhood which issued it at first, and that's called program income that then recycles back into the program. Not oftentimes in a government program where we have money recycling back like this. Um, in this particular situation for NRP's phase one and phase two only, CPP doesn't um, uh, allow this, but or doesn't have this, but in NRP phase one and phase two, a little over $35 million has been paid back into the program um, from um, uh, program income. Um, that's a little over 15% of the total capitalization of NRP phase one and phase two, so it's a significant amount of money. And I should say about, um, of that uh, 35 million that's come back, um, a, a little over half of that has come back to just in the last 10 years, so it's been fairly recent that um, the um, about amount of money coming back in has increased. Uh, one other thing I want to mention before uh, um, I conclude is that the um, first 20 years of NRP, there wasn't any real expectations set on neighborhood organizations on the timing of spending their money. Um, it was really left up to the lo local um, organizations to determine how quickly they wanted to disperse funds. Some neighborhoods moved that money out quickly into the, into the community, others um, spent that over a more of an extended period of time. In 2015, in part of an um, effort to make sure that the monies were actually getting out in a timely manner and also to make sure that the plans that neighborhoods had developed for spending those monies were still relevant, the council passed what's called, what was called the NRP expenditure policy, which set some thresholds in place. This affected NRP phase one and phase two only. And basically, the thresholds are that within seven years of the allocation or the plan being approved, 
they have to be 95% contracted and 85% um, percent of the funds need to be expended. Again, this was an effort to give an adequate amount of time to fund projects and programs, but also making sure that the money was moving out. We do um, an ongoing compliance check on that and all neighborhoods right now are in compliance with that expenditure policy. One final note is the CPP program, when that was put into place, actually has a much shorter time frame to it. It's not nearly as much money as what NRP phase one and phase two have, but um, the CPP program, which was adopted in 2010 and refined several times since then, basically sets into place that um, it's up to the department director, currently myself, um, to make the determination if a neighborhood's sitting on uncontracted money too long. We have a department policy that basically after two years of allocation, if a neighborhood has not moved on the money or submitted an application and, and moved for contracting, that we then start um, uh, initiating further action to make sure that that money is moved out. With that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, um, Mr. Rubador. Are there any questions or comments? Council Member Schrader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I want to thank the Director uh, Rubador, as well as uh, Bob, Steve, and Jack for really throwing this together at the last, last minute. Um, I, we've just had a lot of questions about how we're going to potentially fund neighborhoods, and I thought it was important to really get this number out there and really get a little more explanation. For me, when I read the Q report and just have that one line about 34 million, um, and especially coming from neighborhoods, there's a lot more to that number. Um, and we really just wanted to make sure all my colleagues knew, you know, 34 million is a lot, uh, but that's not money that's with the neighborhoods. That's not something that is kind of coming back uh, in any way. And uh, just to be kind of clear, this, this, are these, uns these are, um, this is money that the neighborhoods currently have available. No, it's not just unspent funds. Um, uh, Chair Jenkins and uh, Council Member Schrader, if I understand you correctly, uh, these these funds are um, these are allocated to the neighborhood organization. They're either contracted or uncontracted at this point, but it is available to each of the organizations. And I believe with the RCA, there's a listing of each neighborhood and which neighborhood has which um, how much money in each one of those categories for for both Phase One and Phase Two, as well as the CPP program. So these funds are available for neighborhoods to use. Okay. Thank you. Um, Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much. I have a couple questions. Um, it, it looks like there's over 19 million that's um, unspent and uncontracted. Could you just talk a little bit about why that isn't contracted and maybe how much time we expect it, it to get committed? I mean, you mentioned the seven years, um, but I think it might help us to understand why some neighborhoods would still have significant amount of, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that they haven't un they haven't spent and they haven't contracted yet. Uh, Chair Jenkins and uh, Council Member uh, Gordon, um, uh, my colleagues will probably jump up and add a little bit more detail to this. Um, again, remind uh, uh, part of that is a little over four million is from the CPP program, which is just a recent allocation that went out. Um, also, the the kind of speed of program income coming in right now has picked up. And so neighborhoods are getting um, that money back and they may not have um, moved that into contracting yet. Basically when, that, when the program income comes back in, it goes back into the same plan strategy that it was before, but neighborhoods can move that to a different strategy. And then that, then that has to go through a contracting process as well. I don't know if you guys had a little bit more that you wanted to add on detail on that, but. Um, if, if I may, so. <laughs> Um, Council, S Steve Gallagher, I'm policy specialist for the um, NCR department, and part of the part of the explanation would be some neighborhoods might have um, planning going forward. I would say like the Southwest Rail um, area, where those neighborhoods have a long-term plan of where they might spend their funds, but there's no contracting opportunity at that time. However, all all of those dollars are in strategies, which which the council. Um, approves in their in their phase one or phase two plan. So they're accounted for with plans to go forward. They're just not contracted at any one specific time, or not yet. But we'd expect them to be within the seven-year policy of 2015? I th all of them will be reviewed within the seven-year seven year time, time period, depending on where, um, what their intent for those funds are. A waiver could exist 
Um, like if the uh, light rail or commuter rail does not happen for a few more years, there could be a waiver issued because that's where they're planning for. And I guess my other question might be just as complicated, uh, but um, I was, so it looks like there's a lot of money that's come back in program income, but we don't necessarily, and I'm sure we could come up with an accounting of how much of that makes up the the totals in each one of the categories of uncontracted and not contracted. Is it significant? Is that uh, much of it? I mean, the, the total program income is 35 million and then the total um, uh, figure for the other one is 37 million or something like that. So um, there's, uh, there's almost a match. I'm just wondering if we have that and if we think that's a significant portion of that is from program income. So uh, Chair Jenkins and uh, Councilmember Gordon, I'm going to invite um, Bob Cooper from Development Finance. We do this in collaboration with Development Finance and ma managing this, and that would be a question I think uh, that he'd be able to answer a little bit better than me as far as what is the breakdown within that, that number. Thank you, and welcome, Mr. Cooper. Madam Chair, Councilmember Gordon, I'm Bob Cooper. I work with for the Development Finance Division of the Finance and Property Services Department. Um, this question will quickly drive us um, deep into the weeds of NRP. In phase one, there was little distinction made between program income and action plan funds. So we do have a sense, but not an exact sense. In phase two, because the rules changed, we do know a separation on the contracted side of, of what program income dollars are contracted and which action plan dollars are. However, on the expenditure side, we just track overall expenditures by contract. So on the contracted side, we can get a pretty good sense. Um, and I think it's safe without having done the actual analysis that a fair portion of the uncontracted dollars are program income funds that have returned. Um, along with, let me quickly add so I don't leave a misperception, it's only within the last three years that $10 million of action plan funds have returned um, for to be available to neighborhoods to contract. And so some of those also sit there as neighborhoods begin to do the planning and to get those funds out as well. So over the last three years, between program income and new capitalization, um, it's probably over $20 million that has just become available within the last three years. Does that help explain some of that? I think so. <laughs> I'm, I'm also a little bit curious about how many neighborhoods didn't create revolving loan funds, and so they would have no program income coming back. Um, it's because it sounds like there's probably a big variety, and people that uh, and, and groups that organized and planned it out, and they have program income coming back would have more resources and more flexibility than those neighborhoods who didn't, and it's also possible that those neighborhoods that were able to do those kinds of programs were a little bit wealthier because people could pay back those loans that they got for their home improvements. Um, so have we done any kind of analysis about that? Um, we do um, track program income by neighborhood and know exactly how much program income has come back to each neighborhood. You're correct, some neighborhoods, the residents of, of the neighborhood needed home improvement grants, not loans, and so that didn't offer a repayment option. Some of the neighborhoods, because of the um, condition of the housing, invested their money in commercial development projects, or um, what we've seen a lot lately is investment in affordable housing projects citywide. Um, few neighborhoods have had little or no program income, so almost every neighborhood has received some program income, some as much as um, I believe the, the Longfellow neighborhoods over the life of the program have received as much as almost $3 million in program income from various um, projects that they've invested in. Have we done any kind of analysis about um, the, I don't know what term we want to use, but impacted areas or the, um, Remember, there were the three categories of neighborhoods when NRP started. Um, so I would have just a theory that would say, oh, 
that would give an opportunity for a wealthier neighborhood to have more program income because they would have people who could afford to pay back loans. Whereas if, if, if a, a area that was poorer, um, they would have a bigger need to invest in their housing and they wouldn't have a, an ability to do it quite the same way. Does it look like um, the, my little theory here is borne out in any fact? Madam Chair, Council Member Gordon, um, we haven't done that specific analysis. It would be easy enough to do. I'd be glad to um, pull that together. The three types of neighborhoods that Council Member Gordon refers to were uh, an, an integral part of the original NRP program where every neighborhood designated itself as a revitalization, redirection, or protection neighborhood. And that was part of the 20 year revitalization plan that the city council approved those three neighborhoods. But it would, um, I'd be happy to pull that sort of information together. It would be good see to see that because it, like. it would be the kind of um, institutional um, classist racist practice that we want to break ourselves of, if that makes any sense. Would it, would it be safe to say that these program incomes are going to continue to accrue over time, I mean, so these fund balances won't remain static. They will continue as people continue to pay back. Those fund balances will grow. Uh, Chair Jenkins, I think that would be a, a, a correct statement. There's going to be additional program income coming in for years to come. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure that um, folks are clear about it. So the money that is NRP or CPP um, that is still in the fund balance, is that impacted by any sort of um, neighborhood-related programmatic changes like the ones that we're talking about with Neighborhoods 2020? Uh, uh, Chair Jenkins and Councilmember Cunningham, um, Neighborhoods 2020 is about the money moving forward. It's not about the money that's currently there or looking backwards currently. Um, I would say that uh, as, a, as, a, um, uh, as we look at this, we're going to move forward with the Neighborhoods 2020 work. We're also looking at ways to simplify the NRP program itself because it is a, um, it is a heavy bureaucracy type program and requires a lot of um, paperwork, a lot of kind of levels that people have to understand. And that creates um, a system where you have people that are in the know and those that aren't. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is to get to a place where basically any resident of Minneapolis can easily understand the program. And so we are talking about how we can reform that to make it easier but we're not talking about changing any of the money within that program at this point. And if I may, um, so um, with the revolving fund, any revenue that's generated from that, does that still fall within the money from the past, or is that something that's impacted by Neighborhoods 2020? Um, Chair Jenkins and uh, Councilmember Cunningham, the, it would take a city council action to change any of that, any redirection of any of that money. So just to be really clear, it's not something that would be decided by the department. What I'm speaking of as far as making this simpler is really programmatic changes, which still would need to come to the council for approval. And again, that's trying to basically simplify the system. Um, NRP is complex. It's just as even as you hear and we talk about the program, it's complex. And the easier and simpler we can make this flow, the better. But that's not in that conversation is not talking about a redistribution of those funds. Um, that's not happening with Neighborhoods 2020. I just wanted to be really clear. That is something that we will start addressing as we move forward. Ultimately, as we move into this um, vision of having our neighborhood organizations be partners with the city around racial equity and building greater inclusion and diversity within their decision-making process, we need to look at all the programs that are affecting that in order to make sure they're in alignment with each other around those goals. Um, neighborhoods 2020 is about that. Um, we will come back and take a look at um, NRP as a program and ways that we can make do alignment changes to that to make that actually in alignment with those goals as well. I mean, basically at this point, what we're talking about is um, the, new, the new neighborhood program, whatever we call it, um, Neighborhoods 2020, is about $4.1 million a year. There's still about $30 million left. If you take the CPP money out, there's still about $30 million left in the NRP program. I think it's, it would... To achieve our goals, looking at those collectively in programmatic ways is going to be really important to achieve the racial equity goals that we're looking at. 
Great. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure folks were clear about the moving forward versus the past. Yep. So, this isn't this isn't about changing. This is really about changing the program um, moving forward. The, the program moving forward. There'll be any f actions regarding NRP still need to come would have to come back to the council at a later date. Yep. Uh, council Member Wright. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President or Vice President. Um, the um, question that Councilmember uh, Gordon raised is an interesting one in terms of uh, impacts of program and ability to pay back. Um, it just reminded me, I think Hawthorne neighborhood or some neighborhood group actually looked into that in terms of the default <coughs> impact. Uh, and one of the things that was discovered, and I think our staff might have collaborated with them and we might have those findings uh, somewhere. But I think one of the things that came up was the resiliency that was added by going through uh, financing a home through a uh, city or neighborhood sponsored program in terms of the default rate. It was significantly lower by those who went through their, their community group programming versus being exposed to some of the predatory practices or the open market. Um, so that might be something, uh, a good place to start, to start probing the questions that uh, Councilmember Gordon uh, um, raised just recently. Also, I just wanted to note just for the record, you know, the, this is a timely uh, a report. We had one last term, and maybe this is the kind of thing we do every term, as we just really revisit this. I think one of the things that was highlighted in the last term was that seven year wasn't an arbitrary number. It was based on a couple of things. It was based on basically looking back and seeing what the statistical actual rate of expenditure was over the program. Mm -hmm. Seven was kind of that number, but it was also recognized that it was coincidental to the fact that that was in practice, though it wasn't a formal requirement. In practice, that was sort of an expectation. You would have a certain amount of years to plan. You have a certain amount of years to put together um, a strategy to implement that plan. You would start to implement portions of that plan in partnership, and there, as you've outlined, uh, pro project-based timelines that were, you know, in the three-plus range, uh, typically. Um, and so, when you put in the planning the buy-in from the community, the targeting of a specific program, getting a partner and getting a project forward. Um, people kind of followed that almost instinctively, that seven-year-ish range. And so I think both statistically in terms of how it happened and how in practice one expected it to happen, that's what happened. Um, and so the seven is far from an arbitrary number. Uh, and I'm, I just wanted to highlight that because that was definitely discussed the last time you gave uh, this report. Um, and so again, I think um, the council members have raised a, a certain level of interest in what the data can mean moving forward, and I'm certainly going to be engaged in that as well. Well, um, uh, I was going to say there was no more discussion. However, we do uh, have the council president. Thank, council president. thank you, Madam Chair. I, right. I, um, I don't know how necessary it is to mention this, but I do think reflecting back on this um, as we look forward, it raises some questions about striking that balance between making sure that, you know, neighborhood um, priorities are grassroots and reflect what the community is really wanting to prioritize, but also potentially having more consistency across the city about um, things like combining organizations or not, or priority funding for things like revolving funds or not, um, just because there's such a... Um, difference across the city so that when we start at any given point now, looking forward, these neighborhood organizations are in really different places based on the decisions that they've made in the past. So um, again, I think for me, one of the conclusions here looking at this is looking forward, I, I am excited about the ways in which that I think we're trying to provide a little more guidance and consistency for neighborhoods um, so that if they didn't choose to do a revolving fund, 30 years ago, they're not like now left with no money and now they can't do anything, right? So I, I think just providing that clear and consistent um, uh, approach as much as we can as we look forward is I think one of the goals that we all have and, and is reinforced by looking at the status of what's happened so far. Mr. Rivera, did you want sure, to respond? Sure, if I could, uh, just uh, um, Chair Jenkins and uh, uh, Council President uh, Bender. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, and I think as you see, it was a little bit uh, um, uh, alluded to in here, but even over the last um, um, seven or eight years, our work with neighborhood organizations has changed a lot. Um, we've been a lot more specific. We've been a lot more, we started the board diversity survey, for example, in 2014, and it's been going on now. It'll This will be the sixth year that we do it, uh, because we know that, um, diversity in leadership matters, um, and it affects how resources are allocated. And so we've been going on this this path, basically, of trying to provide 
better guidance and expectations around um, our neighborhood organizations while respecting their independence. A bit of a tension um, that exists between that, but we do have a network of 70, 70 independent nonprofit organizations. We want to respect that. But also at the same time, as we invest public dollars into that, we are looking for public outcomes and around specific goals. So it kind of getting back to what I was referring to, um, council, uh, with, to with Council Member Cunningham, is as we roll out 2020, and we expect we're, we're expecting to release those uh, um, program guidelines this Friday. Um, there's more. There's a lot more clarity in there about um, basically the role between the city and neighborhoods and expectations. Um, we've tied a lot of the work directly to some of the goals that are in the 2040 plan. Um, I don't want to release too much at this point because there's a few more things to change, but really looking at tying it to existing city policies, ex existing city goals that provide that clarity. What I'm saying uh, also, just to kind of pull back to the NRP conversation, is then given the amount of money that's really in both of those programs, is really working on ways that we can um, adjust that program as well to be in concert with um, the alignment of the new Neighborhoods 2020 program as well. And so that bringing that clarity together, because it doesn't do us any good if we have one program that has a lot of clarity and the other one is is maybe incongruent with, with that and trying to bring that better into alliance. And I think I'm um, answering, uh, not that you had a question, but kind of addressing that point of uh, being more specific and clear about what we're looking for moving forward. I agree, and I think one of the things that I think is most exciting about where we're headed is this idea of us um, encouraging and supporting more collaboration between organizations across the city because yep take you know loans for example or home ownership opportunities i mean that might be something that sparks from a particular neighborhood but would be really impactful in lots of neighborhoods citywide just as one ex of many examples i think of uh, patterns we're seeing across the city often um, in neighborhoods that are you know far apart geographically within our city but that are facing similar dynamics of displacement or um, change and so i think um, that piece of Neighborhoods 2020 is really exciting to think about how we can better support that partnership and collaboration across the city. Hey, um, well, seeing no further discussion, and before I move this report, I do want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Warsami. Um, and with that, I will move to receive and file this report. All those in favor say aye. And the opposed say nay. And that item carries. Thank you, Mr. Rubador, and to your staff and to the finance uh, department staff as well. Appreciate you. your timely report. Um, and then uh, next we will receive our um, reports from the standing committees on matters to be considered by the full council this coming Friday. Um, the first report is from the Economic Development and Regulatory Services Committee given by the Vice Chair, Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, EDR, the Economic Development and Regulatory Services Committee has six items to bring forward to the full council. Uh, one is the liquor license approvals. Two is the liquor license renewals. Uh, three is the gambling license renewals. And four is a uh, rental dwelling license conditions uh, for a number of addresses. Five is uh, the Minnesota Department of Employment, Economic Development, Metropolitan Council's tax based revitalization account, uh, and Henneman County's Environmental Response Fund uh, Fall 2009 Brownfield grants. Uh, and six is a uh, passage of a res resolution committing to continuing the work of economic inclusion affordable housing and racial equity by working together as elected officials and departmental staff. Uh, and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. Uh, are there any questions? Are there any questions? Seeing no questions, we will move to the next committee report, the Housing Policy and Development Committee, given by Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much. The Housing Policy and Development Committee will be bringing forward three items for consideration. The first um, deals with um, land sales to uh, implement our missing middle housing pilot program. Um, there are several lots that are being sold to help uh, um, promote the preservation and also the creation of more um, 
medium density housing. Uh, second item is authorizing a notice of funding availability for the implementation of the housing stabilization pilot program funds. And the third item is to um, uh, a motion to delete something from the agenda from a previous meeting, which is a resolution calling on the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority to delay further Section 18 demolition and disposition action on its scattered site housing. That motion failed in committee um, five to one, and the committee's recommending to, we move to delete it from the agenda. Thank you, Chair Gordon. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Seeing none, the next committee report is the Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee given by the Chair, Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee is bringing forward two items for approval. Uh, the, the first is a, a, a slate of Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Aging Appointments, and item number two is also um, a group of transgender equity council appointments. Um, I really recommend for my colleagues to check out the RCAs. Um, there are short blurbs about each one of the applicants um, and the appointees. Uh, we are very blessed to have folks with such experience and knowledge and expertise volunteering their time to help advise us as an elected body. So I um, recommend folks check that out. We also had a presentation from the Office of Violence Prevention with an update about the strategic planning process that they're in right now um, with a timeline and just kind of discussing where they've been, what they're doing. Um, so I would recommend for my colleagues as well as the public to check that out because it's uh, very informative about where we've been and where we're going um, as a city with operationalizing our Office of Violence Prevention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Seeing no questions, the next committee report is the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee. Uh, and I think that report will be given by the Vice Chair, Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Vice President Jenkins. Uh, the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee is bringing forward five items for consideration. Uh, the first is the reappointment of Barrett Lane as Director of Emergency Management. Uh, second is our contract with the University of Minnesota for bomb detection at TCF Stadium. Uh, the third is a contract with the BCA for participation in the state's human trafficking task force. Uh, the fourth item is another, uh, oh, sorry, both three and four are uh, contracts related to the human trafficking task force. And item number five is uh, uh, training reimbursement from the Minnesota Board of Firefighter Training and Education. I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Council Member um, Fletcher. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Seeing no questions, the next committee report will be given by Chair Wright of the Transportation and Public Works Committee. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Vice President. The committee will be forwarding 15 items for consideration. Uh, item one and two are street resurfacing projects in the city. Uh, three is the 2020 uh, Minneapolis Open Streets uh, list of routes. Uh, item four is the Highway uh, 252 I-94 Min Pass expansion project. Uh, and we will continue to have uh, further refinement of the language that'll come before council. Um, five is the contract with employee strategies for training in the Public Works Department. Six is also a contract with Park Marble, a mobile payment application for on-street parking. Seven is the grant application for the 2020 Metropolitan uh, Council Regional Solicitation for Federal Transportation Funds. Um, eight is a request for proposals for Upper Harbor Terminal Redevelopment Project Planning Engineering Services for Street and Public Utility Infrastructure. Nine is the Industrial Boulevard Multi-Use Trail Appropriation Increase. Ten is the President's Bicycle Boulevard uh, Layout Approval. Some uh, uh, well welcome improvements there. Uh, and the final items, uh, 11 through 14, are all bids for activities of the uh, department. And the final was the uh, report from the Americans uh, with Disability Act Transition Plan for Public Works which generated a lot of interest and discussion at committee. I'll stand for questions, Madam Vice President. Thank you. Um, Council Member Reich, are there any questions? Are there any questions? See, no questions. The next committee report is the Ways and Means Committee given by Chair Warsami. 
Thank you, thank you, Madam Vice President. The Ways and Means Committee brings 19 items for approval on Friday. Item number one is a Civil Service uh, Commission appointment. Uh, item number two is a reappointment of the City Assessor. Item number three and four are legal settlements. Item, items number five to 13 are contract amendments with regards to the Public Service Building Project. Item number 14 is a bid for customs vinyl artwork for the public service building project. Item number 15 is a contract amendment with AP Midwest LLC for the east side storage and maintenance facility. Item number 16 is a bid for a roof depot hazardous materials abatement project. Item number 17 is a capital long range improvement committee or click appointments. Item number 18 is a 2021 to 2026 capital budget process and net debt bond resource levels and the final item item number 19 is the downtown traffic control services funding for 2020 to 2022 and i happily uh, stand for any questions thank you chair Sami. are there any questions are there any questions seeing none our last committee report will be given by council member schrader the chair of the zoning and planning committee Thank you, Madam Chair. The Zoning and Planning Committee will bring forward five items uh, for approval on Friday. Uh, the first is the appointment of uh, three new commissioners to the City Planning Commission. Um, also, just encourage my colleagues to take a look. We we're really lucky to have some really qualified people that will be joining us on the Planning Commission. Uh, second is the approval of a, vaca um, of a vacation at uh, 125 First Street North. The third is the approval of a street vacation at 907 Sibley Street Northeast. The fourth is the approving of a rezoning at 1600 Penn Avenue North. And the fifth is the rezoning uh, for the property at 2800 North Wyzetta Boulevard. And I'll happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Chair Schrader. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Saying that there is no further business before this committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>